Welcome. This talk is called uh, Descent into Darkness. Uh, understanding your system's binary interface is the only way out. Um, so we're going to talk about what that means shortly. Uh, so who am I? I'm Joe D'Amato. Uh, I live in San Francisco, used to work at VMware, went to CMU, uh, some stuff that I work on. Uh, I wrote the first version of uh, Memprof uh, that you saw the web demo of yesterday. Um, I wrote some LTrace patches, some uh, MRI thread improvement patches and stuff. I maintain a blog, timetobleed.com. Uh, that's the actual URL, if you don't believe me. Um, and on Twitter, I'm just Joe D'Amato. All right, so enough of that. Uh, so we only got 30 minutes right now. Uh, so probably won't have enough time to get through everything, but I'm just going to try. Uh, so I just got to say, welcome to flight school. Uh, we just got to roll right now. Um, so I have no clue why this talk was actually accepted. Uh, there's only about five lines of Ruby code in it. Um, but before we actually get started, I need to introduce you to a really, really good friend of mine, um, Satan. Um, and the reason why I need to meet my, my good buddy Satan is because uh, this talk is basically about how being evil is like totally awesome. Um, so in other words, you shouldn't actually do any of the stuff that I'm talking about in this talk ever, uh, unless you do it in a VM, because you could seriously uh, destroy your system. Uh, but if you get it working right, like amazing things are possible, which is what we're going to show. Okay, so what's the problem? Uh, basically, the problem is my read process is 700 megabytes, and I want to know why. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw Yehuda talk yesterday when he was saying object allocations were free. I was like having a seizure in the corner over there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all right, so so we have so there's Ruby. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it, it's it's large and, and slow, um, and we want it to be we, we want it, yeah, we, <laughs> we want it to be uh, you know small and fast, uh, like that guy. So what's so what's the problem? Uh, the problem is it's really easy to leak references in your Ruby code, right? So if you leak a reference to an object, that causes that object and any objects that that object references to stick around in memory forever. So let me show you a picture of what that means. So as long as somebody somewhere is holding a reference to the object on the top there in gray, uh, this entire tree of objects cannot be freed. Um, and that can actually add up to a lot of memory really fast. Um, but sort of also really important too is that every GC cycle, GC is going to scan this tree of objects and it's going to burn CPU cycles looking at it saying like, hey, are these free yet? No. Are these free yet? No. Over and over and over again. Um, and that can actually add up to quite a bit of CPU that's being burned every GC cycle. Uh, but you might say, hey, you know, memory is cheap. CPUs are cheap. I don't really care. I'm not scared. Um, but I would say, hey, you know, Ruby's GC is a naive stop the world market sweep GC, uh, which basically means that the more objects that stick around in memory that you don't need, the longer your GC runs are going to take. Um, and the longer GC runs take, the less time your app actually has to run Ruby code. Um, and that's bad, obviously. Uh, so we want to eliminate, if we eliminate leaked references, we reduce the length of GC runs, run more Ruby app code, everybody's happy. Um, but, and that's cool. Uh, we want to do that, but how? How can we track down these reference leaks? Um, so the problem requirements, right? Uh, <laughs> anybody who knows me knows that I'm really lazy, and I don't want to do any work that I don't have to do or that I can make somebody else do for me. So I don't want to apply patches to Ruby, and I don't want to rebuild Ruby, because doing that's hard. I don't want to break binary compatibility with my extensions. I just want to do this once, just have it work. I really want it to just be a gem. I just want to require a Ruby gem, do memory profiling, and then just be done. And then anything other than that is way too much work. Um, luckily, my boy Satan has my back. Uh, we can do some really, really nasty things to actually get this going right. Um, I'm actually going to skip these two slides real quick because I don't think we're going to have time to get through everything if I don't. But all you really need to know is that um, AMD64 is just a processor spec. And Intel and AMD both, uh, so AMD invented the AMD64 processor spec, but Intel implemented it as well. Uh, and they named it Intel64. So if you see AMD64 on here anywhere, it actually applies to Intel CPUs as well. It's just the name of the spec. Um, so I'm going to skip this too. This is basically just saying, you know, they both try to implement it and, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, anyway, so, you know, what's an ABI? Uh, so application binary interface, what does that mean? According to Wikipedia, it describes the low-level interface between a program and the operating system or another application. Uh, that doesn't really mean that much, uh, but what's contained inside of it are things like alignment. So it'll specify the alignment of data types, uh, calling conventions, object file and library formats, and sometimes, too, syscalls, how they live, where the, you know, how they work, whatever. 
Um, so in terms of ABIs, like how do you actually find them? What's the deal? So there's a System 5 ABI, which is like the big, the big one above all of them. Uh, it's 271 pages, and then underneath it, there's architecture-specific supplements for each of them. Um, and the awesome thing about the AMD64 supplement is that it says, yo, include everything in the 3D6 supplement, except with these changes. So if you actually want to do any like, low-level work on the 64-bit uh, x86, you have to read all three of those. Um, and if, you know, there's other specs for other architectures, too. But luckily, I brought copies of all three of these, and we can just chill and read them like, for the rest of the day. Um, no, but like, actually, let's blaze through some of this stuff right now. So we gotta, we gotta use some evil devices to get some of this stuff going. Um, you have NM. NM comes default on OS X and Linux. It just dumps a symbol table. Uh, Objdump will disassemble lots of different object formats. Uh, it'll disassemble ELF, Mako, lots of different things you can do with it. Uh, read ELF is Linux specific, and it'll dump uh, ELF specific information about a binary, which we'll talk about very shortly. And then there's also Dwarf Dump, which will dwarf debugging information. Um, so here's sample usage of NM. I'm using NM on the Ruby binary. On the left right there, you see symbol value. It's value in quotes because depending on the object, the value could be different. It could be an absolute address or just an offset. Um, on the right, you have a bunch of symbol names. And then in the middle, there's some stuff you can read about in the man page. Um, object dump. This is, sorry I'm going so fast. Just got to get through some of this initial stuff, this boilerplate stuff. All right, so object dump dash D. All I'm saying is, yo, object dump, disassemble all of Ruby and give me some data. Uh, on the left there, you have the offsets. Uh, to the right of that, you have the opcodes. So those are the actual machine instructions. So that's like the actual bytes the CPU is reading and executing. And then next to that are the actual instructions. So those are those bytes translated into assembly instructions. And then on the far right, it's just helpful metadata that libopcode will output and tell you, hey, you know, this line is referring to a constant called during GC or a global during GC, and this thing is referring to malloc limit, whatever, just to make it easier to understand what's going on. Um, you also have read elf, which will dump out elf information. There's a lot more output you can get than just this. Uh, there's also dwarf dump, you know, s same idea. Okay, cool. So uh, we need to, we need to uh, meet some new friends before we can really get down and dirty. Uh, so registers, they're important. They're small, fast pieces of memory that live on a CPU. And some registers have specific jobs. Uh, so two examples of registers that have jobs are RAX or RACS. It holds the return value from a function. And there's also RIP, which is the instruction pointer. Keep track of which instruction you're executing. Uh, you, can also refer to you can also refer to registers in pieces. Um, so let's take a look at what that means. So here's RACS uncensored. Um, on the bottom, that's the full 64-bit RACS register. Okay? That guy takes up eight bytes. And in Intel speak, that's one quad word. Um, there's also a register called EAX, which is just the lower 32 bits of RACS. So it's referring to the same piece of memory, but it's just the lower 32 bits. Um, and this guy is four bytes wide, or one D word, one double word. And then that's it. there's a lower 16 bits of that called AX. And then AX is split into two pieces, the upper eight and the lower eight. So you can sort of see, like, by looking at this diagram, this is sort of like, uh, you know, you're, like, digging up, like, remains, right? This is, like, 16-bit CPUs, 32-bit CPUs, and then 64-bit CPUs. They just kept gluing stuff onto the side. Um, so just some, some other simple notes we need to know. There's two different syntaxes for assembly, just to make your life that much more painful. Uh, there's AT&T slash gas syntax and Intel syntax. Uh, by default, all the GNU tools uh, display stuff in gas AT&T syntax, but you can set it to Intel if, if you want um, by using those commands. I personally like gas. That's just what I learned on. Uh, I, I don't know. Intel's hard to read, I think, but, you know, whatever floats your boat. And so unless otherwise noted, all the assembly in the slides coming up will be in AT&T gas syntax. Um, and yes, there is a lot of assembly coming up. Um, so moving stuff. Uh, so everybody else took a poll, and I feel left out if I don't take a poll. Uh, so show of hands if you thought you were going to learn assembly today. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so moving stuff. So how does this work? So in AT &T, so this is only AT&T syntax, right? Keep that in mind. So you have source, comma, destination. You can move immediate values, like that second line right there. I'm moving 0 into the register RBX. Or I can move you know, a register to a register. So I'm moving EAX into RAX. And if you remember from the last slide we just looked at, EAX is the lower 32, so I'm basically truncating whatever's in racks to be only 32 bits wide. Important note, source and destination cannot both be memory. Uh, calling functions, lots and lots of different ways to call functions on uh, the 64-bit CPU. There's only two, ca uh, two ways that we really care about uh, for this talk. Uh, there's the indirect absolute way, where you can think of essentially RBX as a pointer, and the value of that pointer is the absolute address of a function. Um, so that's quite literally dereferencing RBX and executing the code uh, that's found there. The next instruction is just, uh, it's just, it shows an absolute address. Dead beef is the absolute address. But 
that calculation is done relative to the next instruction pointer with a 32-bit displacement. I know that makes absolutely no sense. I'm going to show a diagram of that shortly. Um, so calling conventions, how do you call functions in assembly? Uh, well, arguments live in registers from left to right. Uh, so the first argument lives in RDI, second in RSI, so on and so forth. Um, and that's for integer class items. There's lots of different classes. Um, and stuff gets passed on the stack, too, just like on I386. Uh, and the important thing, this is going to come back to bite us in the ass later, is that the end of the argument area must be aligned on a 16-byte boundary uh, to comply with the ABI. And also there's these huge contracts about whether or not you're supposed to save function, uh, whether you're supposed to save registers yourself or the guy you call is supposed to save registers. So each person has a specific job. If you're the callee, you have to save certain things. If you're a caller, you have to save other things. Um, all right, so I'm going to very quickly walk through some assembly code and the matching C code that goes along with it. On the left, it, or yeah, on the right, left, whatever. On one side is Intel, and on the other side is AT&T. And then on the bottom is C code. Um, so on the top, what are we doing? These two guys, they're just saving the old stack uh, frame base pointer, and they're setting the base pointer to the current stack pointer. So they're just basically carving out a slot saying, yo, we're going to start referencing things from here. Um, these two instructions right here are doing the initial setup. So uh, that sort of move EDI you see on the top, that first instruction. So if you remember from the slide before, RDI is the first argument to a function, right? And as we looked at in racks uncensored, you can refer to pieces of registers. So since the amount, so we're passing an amount down here in the C function, and amount is only four bytes wide. So GCC is outputting an instruction that's saying, hey, it's only four bytes wide, so just move the lower four bytes EDI into this random spot on the stack, R RBP minus 14. Uh, and then it's setting another spot on the stack equal to zero, uh, which is, matches up with that ret equals zero line right there. Uh, so next what's going down is um, we're moving whatever we just moved into RBP minus 14. So RBP minus 14 just had those lower four bytes, which is amount. So, this fir so that first instruction up top matches up with that first line right there, which is just moving uh, amount into the register EAX. The second instruction is just an add. It's saying, yo, take whatever's in EAX, add... Uh, 150 to it, and then the result of that lives in EAX. Um, so that matches up with that line of C code. And then uh, these two instructions are actually totally useless. They're just generated by GCC, and they would be removed on higher optimization levels. Um, and then this just returns from the function, and the result lives in RAX, and you comply with the ABI, and everybody's happy. Cool. OK, so ELF objects. What are ELF objects? What's the deal? ELF objects, uh, they can be executables. They can be libraries. Um, this is what they look like if you were to diagram them. Uh, so each shared library you load into a process has its own set of that that goes along with it. And each set is independent, and they all kind of work together using the runtime dynamic linker. Um, so they have headers. Uh, headers help describe the object. Uh, there's different types of headers uh, to describe segments or sections. Segments are collections of sections. Um, and so memprof actually uses libelf to wander through an elf object and extract useful, useful information. But like I just said, the executable in each shared object it used has its own set of data. Um, and sections that matter to, to this memprof adventure we're going on right now is the, the text segment, that's where code lives. Uh, there's the PLT, which we'll talk about soon, which helps resolve absolute function addresses. Um, because shared objects can be mapped anywhere in your address space. And you don't know until runtime the actual address that a function will be at. So you need this PLT thing to help you figure out where it lives. Uh, and then the PLT needs uh, this other table called the got PLT for storage. Uh, okay, so PLT, PLT, what's the deal with the PLT? Well, uh, it's the procedure linkage table. It's used to find functions in shared libraries at runtime. Uh, shared libraries are precision independent. They can be mapped anywhere in the address space. So by now, you should be thinking, what does this have anything to do with Ruby? Um, and well, it has a lot of things to do with Ruby, actually. These are actually the ingredients we need to do serious, serious evil. Uh, we know the AMD 64 ABI, or we can at least look up whatever we need to know. We know how ELF objects work, and uh, we know, well, I didn't actually go over this, I just don't have time, but just take my word for it, that in the Ruby VM, when you allocate an object, uh, you know, with like string.new or whatever, it calls in the Ruby VM RB new obj, and uh, when it frees it, it calls a function, let's just say it's called add free list. Um, so you won't. Uh, this is pretty much what uh, this guy, Brian Mitchell, said to me a long time ago when I proposed this idea. He said, you won't combine all the stuff you just talked about and rewrite the Ruby VM in memory while it's executing code. Um, and, you know, you should be scared like her. Um, so, sorry, Matt, so I'm going to rewrite Ruby while it's running. I apologize for destroying your VM. Um, 
So OK, so we want to track allocations at freeze. We want to do it as a Ruby gem. So what's the deal? So we know that the Ruby VM calls RB new object to allocate a new object, OK? We need to know when this happens so we can track objects. So we know what call instructions look like. We just talked about calling uh, functions. So why don't we just scan the Ruby binary in memory and just rewrite all the function calls to RB new object to call a handler of ours instead? Uh, I'm not that scared, so you know, let's just do it. Um, so <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so OK, so you disassemble Ruby, and this is what you get. There's just some function somewhere calling RB new object, OK? Uh, that guy there on the left in blue, that's the address of this instruction. Uh, that byte right there, that's actually the call opcode. And then the next four, this is sort of the four byte displacement. Right, so it's trying to call RB new object. Uh, so over there in orange, you see RB new object, can you see that sort of hex string to the left? That hex string to the left is the absolute address of RB new object. That's where RB new object lives in memory. And it's calculating that um, by adding those two things together. That's how, that's how uh, relative call instructions work. Um, so all we need to do is overwrite that part in red, the displacement, so that all calls to RB new object actually call a different function instead. And the other function that we're going to call instead might look something like this, like, you know, call RB new object ourselves, do something to track this object, and then return the object. If we don't actually call RB new object and return the object, then all hell will break loose because the VM was expecting you to return memory for an object. So we need to actually do what RB new object was doing, but do whatever else we want as well. Um, so this trick is cool. It doesn't work for everybody, though. Um, so this only works for Rubies that are built with disable shared that don't have a libruby.so. But if you build Ruby with enable shared, and so this is how most Debian, Ubuntu, et cetera boxes build Ruby with a libruby.so, then code in libruby.so calls RB new object via the PLT. So we need to do something else to handle that case. Uh, so let's look at how the PLT works really quick. So you have this assembly instruction in a Ruby library that was, you know, in a Ruby binary that was built in enable shared, you'll have this instruction, right? So over there in blue on the right, you see it's calling RB new object at PLT. So if we go and we disassemble what lives there, wow, these colors are really bad. I'm sorry, guys. Um, these slides are on time to bleed if you want to fall on your iPhone or whatever. Um, so anyway, at that instruction, if we disassemble it, we see these three instructions, a jump, a push, and a jump. Um, so what's actually going on here? Well, over there on the right, that's just sort of metadata saying, hey, this jump is referring to this absolute address, and this is an entry in the got PLT. So initially, when a shared library is loaded into memory, it has no idea where the function you're trying to call actually lives. So what it does at first is the entry in the table just points to the instruction following the jump, which seems like it makes no sense, but it actually will make sense very, very shortly. So initially, it's set up this way, because it has no idea where it's living. So that instruction is actually pushing an ID. It's saving an ID out for state. And then that second jump is invoking the runtime dynamic linker. So the runtime dynamic linker runs. It looks at this ID that was saved, and it says, OK, word, I know where this thing lives. I'm going to fill in the address in the table and then transfer execution to the function RB new obj. And then this acts like a cache. So the next time when you call RB new object at PLT, it just jumps directly to RB new object without reinvoking the, the runtime dynamic linker. Cool? All right. Uh, no, I just meant like, is everybody like, we, we good right now? Everybody, anybody have questions? All right, word. Um, OK, so, so basically, uh, we hook, so this is a global offset. We hook the global offset table by, we redirect execution by overwriting that entry. So instead of RB new object, we call our handler function. Uh, that's sort of like, so this whole, oh uh, wow, I just killed that. So like this whole setup is the initial setup, right? And then the linker runs and it like writes this thing in there so that next time you hit RB new object correctly. So we want to call our function instead of RB new object. So we can just pretend we're that we're the, the runtime dynamic linker. Um, so we'll just say, yo, I am the linker. I'm going to go in, find the table, and then write the address for my function in there instead, completely bypassing the runtime dynamic linker. Um, so what that looks like in the sort of using that same diagram is you have the PLT entry, and then that entry in the table actually just directly refers to my other function. So we just completely sidestep that that push and that other jump to just go and call our other handler, which uh, that's actually a copy paste. Oh, no, that's right. That's actually right. Yeah, that's right. So that our handler calls RB new object, does some tracking stuff, and then returns it. Um, so you should be thinking, yo, like, your other function is calling RB new object. Like, is that infinite loop? Like, won't it just end up calling itself over and over again? Uh, no, keep in mind uh, that thing I said before about each shared object has its own state. Other function happens to live in the memprof 
uh, shared library. As long as we don't modify memprof but modify everybody else, then we're good. Right, because memprof is still going to resolve symbols the normal way, but everybody else is screwed because I just wrote over their tables. <laughs> um, so we're now tracking object allocation, right? But we need to, f to find leaks, we need to track when objects get freed. Um, so add free list is called in the VM when an object is freed. Why not just overwrite the call instruction for that or hook the god or, you know, whatever. What we just did before, just do that again. Uh, actually, we can't do that because uh, this add free list function is inlined. Um, that right there. So that basically suggests to GCC, like, yo, you can build this thing, output a set of instructions, and then I'll take those instructions, insert them into whoever called me, and then optimize the function from there. Um, so if the thing gets inlined, you won't actually see any calls to add free list. Uh, so what now? You know, are we jacked? Can we do anything? What's the deal? Well, if we carefully study this small snippet of code, we notice that free list is getting updated, right? And free list has file level scope. So this thing just lives at some static address somewhere, and we're just overwriting it every time we update the free list. So why don't we do something really stupid? Um, we know there's some static address. Uh, we know add free list updates to free list. So why not search the binary for move instructions that have free list as the target and just overwrite all of those? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so let's do that. Uh, but we have a problem. We have a problem. Uh, the problem is that the system isn't ready for a call instruction yet. And what does that mean? Well, the 64-bit ABI says that the stack has to be aligned to a 16-byte boundary after any and all arguments have been arranged. Okay? Since we're just overwriting some random move, we have no idea what the state of the system is, and we can't guarantee that we won't completely fuck something up by just doing a call. Um, so we can't just plop a call instruction in there. We have to do something different. Uh, we need to obey the ABI, we need to move things out of the way, we need to align the stack, we need to save the register we're supposed to save. But, you know, what can we do to do that, right? Well, we can do a jump instruction. Uh, jumps have no restrictions. We can just jump anywhere. The difference between a jump and a call is that call saves the return address. So you can do a call and you can go back to where you were before. A jump leaves no trace of where you came from. Um, so we can transfer execution to an assembly stub. That stub will set up the system in accordance with the ABI and then that stub will transfer to our C-level handler, which will do stuff. And then we have to make sure to jump back uh, to where we overwrote that instruction when we're done, because as we said before, jump saves no state. OK, so let's do it. Um, there's an instruction that's updating the free list. Um, we can't overwrite it with a call instruction, because the state of the system is not ready for a function call, as I just said. So we inserted jump instead. Now, we can't change the size of the binary. So the move instruction up there is pretty wide. It's seven bytes wide. The jump is, is not quite as wide. It's only five bytes wide, but you can't change the size of things. So we're going to insert two no ops just to pad it out. Um, and then that, that address right there, that's just the address of the assembly stub. Um, and then when we're done with the assembly stub, we have to jump back here, fall through the no ops, then continue executing code in the VM as if nothing happened. Um, so don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, but this is basically the slightly abbreviated version of the assembly stub that's needed to make hooking uh, free list work. Um, so you overwrite, uh, uh, I wonder if I can get my pointer over there so I can show you something. No, probably not. Anyway, so that first instruction at the top right there, so we, we overwrite the, the, the move that overwrites the free list. We're basically saying, okay, this thing's updating the free list. We're going to completely stomp on it and insert a jump. But we have to actually update the free list. Otherwise, the state in the VM is completely inconsistent. So we need to figure out like, how the free list is being updated, regenerate that instruction to actually do it, save all the stuff we need to save, set the world up to align the stack. Like if you see right there, uh, two spots up from that green box, there's an AND instruction. That's actually aligning the stack to a 16-byte boundary. Um, and that's sort of complying with the ABI. And then that call instruction is transferring to our handler. Our handler says, yo, this object was just freed. Let's mark that in our internal state. Then we return from this handler back to that leave instruction. We restore a whole bunch of state, and then we continue executing the Ruby VM as if nothing happened. Um, and surprisingly, this actually works. Um, so here's a sample of how you might use the gem in a really simple, in a really simple way. Uh, you just have a, you require memprof. Uh, you call memprof.start. You require a bunch of other stuff. Um, and that'll give you output like that. Uh, and, the, and the important thing to notice about this output is that it's not just telling you, like, yo, your, your, your shit's taking up a lot of memory. It's telling you, like, yo, like, these are the actual numbers of objects being allocated on this specific, like in this specific file, 
on this line. Okay, so it's telling you exactly where you're leaking memory. Um, and it even includes the type, too, so you can see what objects you're leaking. Uh, but the really, really important thing about this slide that you should all be like completely out of your mind about is that this slide actually contains Ruby code. Oh my god. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, that, that's cool, but what else can we do with mem memprof? Well, we can also just track a block. We can call memprof.start, track, pass it a file, do stuff, and then track like memory allocations and memory leaks of a specific block. Or we can uh, dump the entire heap as JSON. Um, and if you dump the entire heap as JSON, you can load it into the, to the beautiful web UI that Amon demoed uh, yesterday at the lightning talk. Um, so anyway, there's, there's also a middleware component too. Like I was thinking, like, you know, we were thinking like, oh, wouldn't this be cool if you could insert memprof as middleware and just get per request object count information? That way you can see like per request I'm leaking like 100 controllers or whatever. Um, <laughs> So you can do that. You can do that. Uh, you install the memprof gem. You can require memprof slash middleware, set up some middlewares, and then each request will get an output like this, telling you the number of objects, the file, and the line that these things are being leaked from. So you can easily track down what's wrong with your applications and fix your memory bloat. Um, so as Amon demoed yesterday, uh, there's memprof.com. Uh, you can go there, check it out, play around with it. That's sort of the web UI that's built on top of the output from the gem, right? Uh, so the gem outputs data, the web UI parses it and makes it really easy to read. Um, so there's a couple limitations for memprof. Uh, it only works on AMD64, Linux, and Snow Leopard. Uh, there is some 32-bit support, but it doesn't really work. Uh, working on it uh, soon, hopefully. Uh, it only works on MRI and RE's 1.8 right now. It only works on binaries that are not stripped, uh, and OSX System Ruby is not supported because it is really stripped. Um, Support for EY rubies, uh, those are stripped, but it, support for those is forthcoming, as, as is uh, support for stripped rubies in like Debian and Ubuntu. Um, there's a little more work though for the user end. The user will have to install a debug package that comes with their package manager, so nothing like too crazy, just you know, an app to get installed or emerge or whatever, um, and to get debugging symbols. And I'm working on support for that. Uh, this, I was working on this weekend, actually. And don't worry, too, there's more evil brewing. We have lots of really crazy, stupid ideas that, you know, we hope you'll love. Um, so stay tuned to find out what they are. Uh, and just as a hint, 1.9 uh, support for memprof is right around the corner. Um, so, you know, that's one of the ideas we're playing around with. We're pretty close. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're getting close to the end of the talk. Uh, I just need to say thanks to a bunch of people who, without their contributions, this would have been impossible. Um, so... Use RVM. Without R RVM, uh, without Wayne's project, this would have honestly been impossible to test on all the different rubies. So use his project, give him money, he's awesome. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Hope you were clapping for Wayne, because I'm not done yet. Uh, <laughs> so you, should, you can get memprof. Just to be completely clear, this talk was about the memprof Ruby gem. The gem is completely free, open source, et cetera, and provides text-based output. You can get it at GitHub. It's my GitHub account right there. Uh, so you don't want to do this yet because I haven't cut a new release and the current release on Gem Cutter is pretty old, but once I have a chance to do a new release, you can just do that. If you want to come hang out on IRC and talk about how this works and if you want to help out too, jump in there. And then memprof.com is a separate thing uh, that we're working on on the side that just sort of generalizes. Uh, it loads in data from the full, deep, full, the full heap dump, excuse me, and makes it nice and easy to read. Um, and that's sort of an alpha mode right now. Uh, special thanks to a couple of people. Special thanks to Amon for making the beautiful web UI the JSON output, and you know, much, much more. Thanks to Jake Douglas. Without, without my man Jake up there, none of you Apple people would be able to run this on your systems. Uh, I kept telling Jake when I was working on this, I don't care about Apple. I just want to make this work on Linux. And he was like, well, I care. So he wrote it, so he's awesome. Uh, Brian Mario, or Brian Lopez, because he's cool. And, uh, and this guy over here with the camera, Brian Mitchell, because if he didn't tell me not to do it, then I wouldn't have done it, or something. Uh, <laughs> So, questions, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. What's up, man? Is there any chance of just working with like, that right new RX repeatable memory module? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you, you asked if there was any chance that this would work with a readable, writable memory module? Uh, writable or executable. Writable, oh, so with, with an NX bit? Or writable. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the NX bit, yeah, this works with NX. Because uh, I just use mProtect and I just say I don't care, um, so it's fine. What's up? I, I have this, I have this uh, pretense that um, like uh, 
educational materials about that level of engineering is very cryptic. Yeah. And I was just wondering, is, is there something you'd recommend, like, um, you know, low-level programming for high-level programmers? Kind of thing? Uh, no, actually, to be honest with you, like, I, I, people ask this, like, all the time, and I, I really don't know of an existing resource, that type of information. Um, you just gotta like read lots of code, just disassemble stuff. Um, you can read, you know, the Intel instruction set architecture. Um, I mean, there's just like there's like you have to, like there's like you know some amount of like of like knowledge that like you just gotta go out there and just try to do it. Um, usually on my blog, I blog about like this type of stuff and try to lay it out and explain it in a way that I hope people can understand, like people who, who aren't really familiar with like assembly and like really low level stuff. So if that's your thing, you can check out Time to Bleed and if I ever find any good reading materials there, you know, I'll, I'll definitely post them and link to them. What's up, you have a question? Does it work on Ruby Enterprise as well? Yeah, it works on RE, MRI. Yep. Anybody else? What's up, dude? How does this compare to the state of either um, JRuby or Python, or have you looked into those sorts of situations? Uh, I haven't looked in a JRuby, but I can, so all this evil stuff I just did, I can do the same thing in Python, because um, I'm not scared. I mean, it has to be rewritten so it'll work with the Python VM, obviously, but the same tricks will work because Python, you can load C extensions. So as long as you can load a C extension, then you can just do whatever you want. What's up, dude? Uh, so I, I would like to actually answer the previous question about the materials on that stuff. So there's a book, it's called Programming from the Ground Up. It's a free book, so you can read it online, and it, it's awesome. It has all this stuff on Linux assembly, and it's very easy to read. Yeah, and the memprof source is actually really well documented. We've been working hard on it like the last couple weekends, Jake and I, so you can definitely check out the memprof source to get some information as well. What's up, man? Yeah, I don't really know how it works, but is it possible to sort of dynamically insert D-Trace probes? They can sort of you know, source of the method and say, I want to inject D-Trace probes here and here and here. Uh, yeah, you can inject, you can, so like using like sort of this base framework, uh, like the, the way like memprof actually works, you can do whatever, you can do literally whatever you want. Like you can rewrite Ruby to do what, like if you just say like, hey, I don't like the threading implementation, you can just like remove the one that's in there and insert your own. Um, right, like you can just remove the garbage collector if you really want and do whatever you want. Like, what's up? Yeah, I mean you could, yeah, you could do anything, dude. All right, cool. Thanks a lot, guys.